Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation. This is Ham Nation episode number 264 for September 7th, 2016. Ham's gone wild. Hey everybody, Leo Laporte here. Welcome to a very special episode of Ham Nation. I got a call a couple of months ago from Bob Heil. He said, I got this idea, Leo. Why don't Bob and Gordo and George just take the, take the week off there are so many women in the amateur radio hobby these days that it would really be great to celebrate that and do an all-female ham nation. And I'd like you to host it. And I say, Bob, I think I have to disillusion you about one thing. I'm not a woman, so I'm not going to stick around. But I did want to say this is really exciting. And say hi to Val. Val, how are you today? How are you tonight? Welcome. Oh, I'm doing great, Leo. Thanks for uh, joining the show tonight. Really appreciate it. Really makes this uh, all YL show that much more special. All YL. Young ladies? Yeah, yeah. Young ladies, we are hams gone YL. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just thrilled. I, just a little trade secret. You already did some of the show uh, before I got here and I was watching. And this is really going to be a fun show. It's really going to be exciting. So, I'll, Val, I'll let you introduce uh, your YLs, and I'm just going to sit back and enjoy. Have a wonderful ham nation. We're just really thrilled to have you. And, uh, boy, I tell you, I, I think, I think uh, Gordo really got a great filter there on this one because he just, <laughs> he just uh, looks really fabulous, fabulous. Right, take it away, Val. <laughs> Thanks, Leo. Yes, we do have a great show, and it's going to be, other than Leo, our special guest, it's all YLs. Uh, our chat room is going to be done by uh, Kendra and Abby. Uh, our smoke and solder is going to be done by Audrey, a young engineer in the making. Even Don pulled some strings, and he got a uh, broadcaster from down in his neck of the woods. She's going to, Lisa Marie Lumine, she's going to be doing Amateur Radio Newsline. But I have three great hosts helping me out tonight. First one, out in Colorado, Amanda. Welcome to the show, Amanda. How are you doing in Colorado? We're doing great, Val. Thank you so much. Leo, by the way, thank you for introducing us there. And uh, stay around. You're going to learn a lot tonight. Not only is it ladies' night, it's not just for fun. We're here to learn some stuff, too. So you guys stay tuned. I'm going to teach you about some Aries things. Aries is involved highly out there in California as well, Leo, um, helping with the fires out there. So Stick around. We're going to find out how to fill out some Aries forms to help with your government agencies. Over to you, Val. All right. That sounds really good. And we also have Katie, uh, Whiskey, Yankee, Wank, Whiskey Yankee 7, Yankee Lima. I didn't mean to bust your call, Katie, out in Wyoming. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining the show tonight, Katie. Hi, Val. Thanks so much. It's great to be here tonight and uh, very excited to say hi to the Ham Nation crowd. And thanks to Bob for this introduction and uh, asking me to participate tonight. I'm really excited. And uh, even though it's all YLs tonight, I know all of you guys know this very special young man. I thought it would be all great if we could all give him a quick happy birthday to Mr. Christopher Brawl. Kilo Delta 8, Yankee Victor Juliet. He is 14 today. So happy birthday, Chris. Happy birthday, Chris. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Very good. And we also have live Dr. T. Welcome, Dr. T. Hi there. Glad to be here with you guys live. And uh, we've had a huge solar storm. You guys probably haven't been able to get on the bands much this week. So I'll talk about that, give you a little idea of what's coming up next. And then we're going to dive in some heavy topics about radio propagation and kind of go over what the ionosphere is, is like and 
the different layers and kind of get into a little bit of the science for you. So just because we're YLs doesn't mean we can't uh, think like, uh, you know, YL. Back to you, Val. So as you can see, we've got a great show coming up tonight, or is what we're going to call Ham's Gone Wild. Uh, so let's start it off. I have a video I made of YLs around the world doing ham radio things. Hello, my name's Christy. I'm Katie9GKL. My name is Eva, Hotel Bravo 9, Oxford, Papa, Mexico, and Oscar Kilo 3, Quebec, Echo. Call sign is N2 RJ, November 2, Romeo Juliet, 73. Delta Kilo Zero, Oscar Delta, Stroke Portable, Delta Kilo Zero, Oscar Delta, Stroke Portable. Your 5-9 Wisconsin, copy TR05, Alpha Alpha 11 QSL. I'm not sure if I have your suspect right. So the whiskey queen Japan. QSL, whiskey queen Japan, QSL. 10-4, you're a 4-8 in North Florida. Make my day. <laughs> Well, seven threes, you made my day as well. Um, QRZ, this is Kilo Charlie 9, Whiskey Quebec Juliet calling CQ. in North America. Nan Wynn joins us live from Real Linda with more. Hi, Nan. So I wanted to talk with a couple of the people from the club today. We have Andy and we have Carol. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the ARRL and, and why this? you guys started doing this? You guys have been around since the 70s, but this exercise has been happening since 1933, right? Actually, yes. The American Radio Relay League has uh, been in existence for 101 years now. Even longer than that. Yes. We're the National uh, Organization Association of Amateur Radio Operators. Lima, 5999. Thank you, Papa Japan 6 Alpha. November 2, Tango Uniform. Hey, Lou. It was so much fun making, and, you know, I had such a good response. So I think I'm going to do that on a regular basis. So any YLs out there, uh, for now, I may do another segment on children or students and things like that, but uh, I want to do another YL one, so my address is good on QRZ, so if you want to send me a, a video or photos, I may do another one of those. So a lot of fun. Earlier this week, I had a chance to catch up with a YL who's been on over 20 de-expeditions, uh, Victor Yankee 1, Yan Victor Alpha 1, Yankee Lima, and uh, here's our interview with Helen Archibald. We're here today with Helen Archibald, Victor Alpha One, Yankee Lima. She lives in Nova Scotia. Uh, she's been licensed since uh, 1992. She was Victor Echo to Yankee Alpha Kilo. Uh, she has over 250 FCC entities. Uh, she was the president of CLARA, the Canadian Lady Amateur Radio Association, and she's very active in the CLARA net, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And she's been on about 20 D expeditions. Welcome aboard, Helen. Thank you. Um, 
So let's start off. Let's tell you how how did you get interested in amateur radio? I mean, it's so. I mean, most women don't really go out and get into this hobby. Okay, so the OM got his ticket in the late '80s, and in 1991, oh, and and then our son got his ticket, and in 1991. Uh, there was a de expedition that uh, the OM and our son and some other guys went on to CY9. And I was, uh, I had a receiver, I could listen to them, but I couldn't talk to them. So I decided that before they went on the next one, I was going to get my ticket so I could talk to them. And that's what happened. That would motivate me to get to go to CY9. So is that how you got started in de expeditions? Your husband and your son were going on these? And so, oh, very good. Um, so I know you've been on about 20, you said, and a lot of them are IOTAs, and uh, CY9 was a DXCC entity. So do you, what was your favorite place you've ever been on all your travels? Well, CY9 would be my favorite. Is it? Yes. But it's a challenge to get to and a challenge to live on. So there is a, an island closer to us that, that we've been to numerous times, and that we were hoping to go this year, but uh, health issues got canceled it. So what, what makes CY9 so difficult to get to? Well, first of all, it's a desert island. Nobody lives there. It's, you need to hire a fishing boat to get there. You have to haul all your equipment. Uh, back in uh, 1994, when we went, we were allowed to use the uh, Coast Guard buildings, but now they won't let you use those because they worry something will happen to you. So you have to take everything with you from drinking water to uh, accommodations and, and, of course, all your ham radio equipment. Now, have you been on any D expeditions that had you had some scary moments? Well, on CY9 in 1994, uh, the rowboat that we had used to get from the fishing boat to the island uh, got swept offshore, and two of the guys jumped in two kayaks to go rescue the the um, rowboat, and they got swept out to sea and had to be rescued by a fishing boat. So we thought we were going to lose them. So that was pretty scary. Fortunately, they had a, a Coast Guard radio with them and they were able to contact us and we were able to contact the Coast Guard and the fishing boats heard about it and rescued them and brought them back the next day. Oh, but that was... That yeah. is scary. Yeah, scary. Um, now, I know a lot of wilds out there might be dreaming about maybe going on to some of these islands and operating uh, and having some nice pileups. So what kind of advice would you have for any wilds like myself who want to get on these de expeditions? So the first one I went on was 1994 and by then my daughter had her license so it was my husband, my son, my daughter and myself and a bunch of other guys and the first thing I said was I want to go but I'm not going to look after the food. I'm not the cook. I'm going to go as a ham radio operator. And I have pushed that ever since. I, I pull on the ropes. I help with the antennas. I operate the radio. But the food is not my job. Good that, for you. <laughs> absolutely. That's what I would say to any YL who wants to go. Don't get sucked into looking after the food. <laughs> and cleaning up after them, too. I noticed that all happens a lot of times. So in 1994, when we went to CY9, uh, one of the crew was our daughter, uh, VE2ZOO, who was 14 years old at the time. She hadn't had, she had only gotten her license and she hadn't had much experience. And she was working a huge pileup of Americans and they got out of hand. And so this 14 year old girl said, I'm not working anybody till I finish with, and gave the call sign. And the, the, the whole crowd just went totally quiet whoever he was came back you could tell he was laughing like a drain mm -hmm. and gave his call sign and she worked him and the next probably 10 guys you could just hear how they were laughing and this is 1994 before internet was big people knew that they were working margaret who was 14 and they were just you could tell they were really really impressed and i think of that all the time but that I is think wonderful they have good pileup management skills at the age of 14 good for her now she's yes. still active in amateur amateur radio well not really she uh has a boat in the caribbean in the winter and she does have an amateur radio on it and she does get in the nets down there but uh no she <laughs> she didn't stay active very long but uh, that was one of our highlights um 
So I know you're very active with Clara. You were the president for a while there, and now you're very active on the Clara Nets. So tell us all about what Clara is and what they're, what when the Nets are and things like that. So the Canadian Ladies Amateur Radio Association was fo- founded in uh, 1967, has been uh, on going ever since, and we have three nets. We have an 80-meter net on Monday nights at 9 o'clock Eastern on 3750. We have a 40-meter net on 7055 at 9 o'clock a.m. Eastern, and then we have a 20-meter net on 14120. Uh, and of course, 14120 and 7055 are not available to yeah. Americans, but that means that means we don't have to worry as much about uh, getting drowned out. Uh, they're they're quieter, and so we get can get on there. Well, thank you so much, Helen, for joining us. Appreciate the time you take, and I hopefully the next time I talk to you, it'll be from an island. Next year, we hope. Okay. Well, you take care, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And as far as DX goes, still summer, not a lot of DX. I mean, there was some good stuff that just ending now, but there's two big key DX uh, conventions coming up. The first one of which is W9DXCC, if you want to show that first slide, Brian, or Victor. Um, That is in Chicago. That's September 16th through the 17th. And if you want to go the day before, on the 15th, they're going to have Contest U and DXU. It's only $35. And you can go between uh, classes. So if you want to do one contest class and then two DX classes and then go back to the contest class, you're more than welcome to do that. This is a great convention. It's right across the street from Woodfield Mall. So if you want to bring uh, your uh, significant other, the, there's plenty for them to do as well. Um, this one's a lot of fun. Uh, we always go to this one. Also, the following weekend is W4DXCC. Uh, that one September 23rd through the 24th, and that's in Pigeon Forge or Sevierville, um, which is right there in Pigeon Forge. And they're going to have a ham radio boot camp that Friday before the 22nd, and that is included in your registration for the regular DX convention. And so they're going to have a lot of fun things to teach you about ham radio and get you all set up and going on amateur radio from antenna building to getting on HF to doing a contest, things like that. Uh, So the ham radio boot camp is really cool and it's included in everyone's registration free. So that's always a fun place. Uh, Pigeon Forge is really cool. Um, Also, There is a special event station coming up, uh, the Missouri Highway Patrol. Uh, They're celebrating their 85th anniversary. I actually found that photo. That is the very first year of the State Highway Patrol in Missouri. How cool is that? And they're going to be a Kilo Mike Zero Hotel Papa, and they're going to be on a week from today. So get out there and work those guys. Uh, Show your support for the Missouri Highway Patrol. And uh, last, I think that's a contest this weekend. This weekend, we've got the September VHF contest going on. And the following weekend's a big weekend, uh, Scandinavian Activity Contest, or the SAC as they call it. And then we got three state CUSO parties, New Hampshire, New Jersey, and Washington State. Uh, So get out there, get on the air, and have some fun. Well, now we're going to head it over to Katie, Whiskey Yankee 7, Yankee Lima out in Wyoming. And Katie, why don't you tell us how you got started in amateur radio? I'm doing great, Val. Thanks again for uh, sending it over here tonight. And uh, and at Yankee 7, Yankee Lima, but when I first became a ham 10 years ago, my first call was Whiskey 1 Kilo Radio Bravo, which was my initials. And um, the reason I got into ham radio 10 years ago, actually just 10 years ago this past April, was because I got a job. Um, who would have thought I suddenly landed at the ARRL headquarters in Newington? I had closed my business and was looking for a job in sales and marketing or a nonprofit and found on monster.com a job listing for both for the membership manager at the ARRL. Well, once I got hired, of course, one of the job requirements was to get my license, which I uh, studied like crazy for a few weeks and uh, got my ticket um, fairly quickly, went off to a ham fest, met some people, um, and then I went off to Dayton right away, and I absolutely fell in love with ham radio. 
The following month, I went over to W1AW as the GOTA station that get on the air. And Dan, November 1, November Delta was my GOTA coach. And I had so much fun. It was just an amazing experience to sit in the chair and get active on the air. The following month, I went back to W1AW. I think it was the IARU HF contest and sitting there. And that was my first taste of DX. And really between those two events, I really got excited about ham radio. And it really changed how how I looked at things for my job side of things, realizing that, um, you know, it opened up doors in terms of being able to communicate with our hams. Of course, ham radio is all about communication, but sometimes we don't do it so well when we're talking to each other one-on-one. -on -one. We get behind you know, a microphone or get uh, behind a paddle and we have no problems talking to each other, but sometimes at ham fest, it's not as easy. And so I really wanted to get my chops wet since I discovered I actually did enjoy ham radio. One of the things I did find initially when I would talk to people at ham fest, you know, I'd, I would have my call sign on my name badge but, um, you know, you know, being a woman, sometimes I would get the, you know, get the stink eye from a guy like, are you really a ham? And, and so I realized I wanted to not only prove it to myself, but to be, be able to kind of wear the badge of honor of, of uh, some accomplishments. So I worked on my Worked All States and my DXCC pretty quickly after I got my general license, which took me a couple of years and about six months of classes at headquarters with other staff members. Um, so I did find that actually initially as a female ham out in the field that I really did kind of want to prove my, my worth, if you will. You know, I found a lot of times, you know, guys don't have to do that, but us as female hams, um, we did. I don't see that as much as I used to say 10 years ago, but um, it is a good way to be able to show that you're on air and active is actually starting to put, you know, put some hardware on your walls like we've got behind me. But, you know, I found that the more I did, the more I loved. And really the foundation of ham radio for me is all of you guys. It's it's the people. It's all about ham radio. It's all about who's there, who's behind the microphone, who's behind the key, who's sitting at the desk, who's interacting. And you never know who that person actually is other than their call sign sometimes. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love about ham radio. When I walk into a ham fest, whether it's for my job or just for fun with my husband, who's on the board for the ARRL now, um, you know, I, I kind of think of uh, ham radio as the great leveler. We all are our call signs. We all love ham radio. And it's the one thing that puts us all in common. So one of the things that I started doing when I was the membership manager at ARRL was I really wanted to find a way for people to kind of have a better view of those of us on staff who are active hams. Um, it's kind of funny. Some of the things I heard when I was out in the field, people thought, oh, you know, headquarters is like the, the golden pyramid up in Connecticut and everybody drives Mercedes and um, it's this big, beautiful office building. And I always had to laugh because, you know, the headquarters is really, it's like a 1970s square office building. Um, there's a lot of beaters in the parking lot. Nobody's driving. Well, there might be one Mercedes, but usually it was a visitor. Um, but people didn't really get a feel for who we were as hams. They just kind of saw call signs in a magazine or maybe saw some of us at Ham Fest. And so one of the things I started to do when I talked to people was find out where else they were hanging out. And this goes back in time. And I started doing something called MySpace. So all of you guys, you remember MySpace? Well, that's actually, hey, Wilbanks, I know you're watching. That's where Don and I first met many, many moons ago. And we used to hang out on MySpace together. Well, I realized, you know, that was another way for us to be social and interact and learn about what we're doing with ham radio and also meet up with each other. And then inside of headquarters, because I lived in an apartment and about a year after I started working there, Sean KX9X started working. He was also living in an apartment and we became fast friends and realized, you know, we could help each other out by getting on the air and having some fun. So we fixed up W1HQ inside of the headquarters building and used to go play radio together all the time. Well, we started posting photos of what we were doing and um, sometimes we would do special events at W1AW. And then we started making videos. 
Now, I have to tell you, these videos were nothing fancy by any means. Uh, Joe Karsha and J1 and Q1R, oh my gosh, and J1Q, sorry, Joe, totally busted your call, um, used to set up the video camera and we would just kind of, kind of like today's Facebook Live, we would put videos on YouTube so people could see what we were doing. They could see the operating, they could meet the guests in the station. Um, one of our most popular videos was me at 4 a.m. with my pink fuzzy slippers on, waiting for pizza to be delivered in the middle of a contest. I mean, just silly stuff, but people really resonated with that because they could see us as regular people, as active and active hams having a good time. And so that's one of the things that's really my passion in sharing about ham radio. And I guess you would call it public relations is really um, getting the word out that ham radio is a lot of fun. One of the things that I always found with, particularly with men at ham fest, because of course, there's mostly men at ham fests. Um, a lot of times guys would say, what can I do to get my wife involved? Or I really want to get my daughter involved. And Katie, do you have any advice? And my usually my usual standard answer was, well, make it fun. What is it about ham radio that drives you? What is your passion? What is it that maybe your wife might have in common with that that you can bring her in? I also would suggest to people a lot of times was I'd say, send me an email. We'll set up a sked and then maybe she will, we can talk and maybe she can get on there and say hello and, and see that it's not so scary. Um, if I met some YLs at a ham fest, perhaps, or maybe they weren't a ham radio operator, but they were nice enough to go to a ham fest with their husband. I would tell them how much fun it is, especially, um, you know, a few years ago, there weren't as many women on. I think there's a lot more now than there used to be. And it's always kind of fun to be the only girl in the game, I have to say. Um, you know, I still continue to this day to operate. I, um, I love to be on the air. I don't do it nearly as often as I should have um, or should, but I like to be able to get on the air and pick and choose sometimes. I like to get on the air and just rag to periodically. Um, one of the things that um, I do a lot of, which many of you know and, and now is part of my job, is social media related to ham radio and spreading the word. And some of the things that I like to tell people and remind them when I'm kind of giving a little bit of instruction about using social media and ham radio is there's a few things always to remember, especially for those of you that maybe run your Facebook page for a club, is, you know, a few simple rules is one, remember it is social, so you want to have fun when you're doing it. Remember, people want to participate in something that is enjoyable. They don't want to do it because it's a drudgery. I also like to suggest, remember to follow the golden rule. If you're gonna put something out there, you make sure it's something that you would um, repeat, you would like someone to share. Um, don't say anything, or I should say, don't type anything that you wouldn't say out loud in front of your family, in front of your kids, in front of your grandkids. It's amazing what people sometimes will do when they get on social media and they don't feel like they have anyone to be accountable for. But if you're out there promoting your club, your um, ARRL section, and your Aries group, always be positive and um, put ham radio in a good light. Same thing with photos. Make sure you have a name badge and a smile. Put someone in front of the camera who's doing something that's active and engaging. The same thing with bringing volunteers into your group. It's all about inclusiveness. Bring people in, encourage them, and make it fun. After all, you know, that's what this is all about. I don't know about you guys, but I get on the ham radio because I'm having fun with it, not because it's a chore. Um, I certainly want to um, build up my skills so that should they be needed, um, I would be available to help. But for the most part, I do it because it's fun. One of the things that I see nowadays, particularly because of social media, we now have a better chance to interact with each other and see what's happening and seeing the amount of activity by kids, particularly um, in Val's video just a little bit ago, you saw one of the pictures with um, Bev, who is a teacher at the Dorothy Grant Elementary School. She is turning hams out left and right. Um, Marty, KC1CWF, and Christopher, KD8YVJ, are both in the chat room and watching tonight. Those guys are on fire. And Skyler, right here in my own division, who was the young ham of the year and our young ham of the year here in our division. These are the young people that we need to embrace and encourage and keep them moving forward. And I guess if I were to say anything about what's important about ham radio to me, that's a big part of it is about encouraging people, getting them on the air, whether they're men, women, or children. But this is the greatest hobby in the world as far as I'm concerned. I don't know what other hobby you can ha do 
or participate in where you can have strangers in a room that become best friends simply because of that one thing together. We had a ham visit from California last week who we've met once or twice at a ham fest, hang around on Facebook together. He and his wife stopped by. We all went out to dinner and had a great time. It was just as if we'd known each other forever. You tell me and I challenge you, what other hobby can you do that with? For me, it's all about the passion and energy and the excitement of the people involved in ham radio. And that is kind of my uh, my bell that I ring all the time when I talk about ham radio and encourage people to do the same. Share what's exciting and um, encourage people to participate and join because, you know, it's really it's the stories of our lives that we can share through this one little bit called ham radio. And it really does. It makes the world a smaller place when you have this in common. And I appreciate all of you guys and so many of you I get to interact with on a regular basis and um, I just really appreciate the opportunity to be here on Ham Nation tonight to talk a little bit about it. And um, at that, I think that's about all I wanted to say about what's happening with me in Ham Radio. So hopefully I didn't go over my time slot. I kind of lost track of myself. <laughs> but with that, uh, we are going to, do you want me to pass it over? Or Yeah, no, that was wonderful. That was really, really Thank wonderful, you, Katie. Katie. Yes, it was. Um, right. And now let's hear a word from our sponsor, ICOM. September is National Preparedness Month. Set some time aside and review your emergency communications plan for air, land, or sea. Make sure your ICOM equipment is ready to go for any situation. ID 5100A has taken innovation and mobility to the next level. With its touchscreen and internal GPS, this radio is a must-have while assessing a situation. The large 5.5-inch display responds naturally to the touch. DVDV Dual Watch receives both FM-FM and FMDB mode signals simultaneously. Show your position, course, and speed with the integrated GPS receiver. And the optional VS3 Bluetooth headset provides hands-free communication. Connect your Android to ICOM's most popular dual-band transceiver, the ID51A+. Filled with enhanced functions and digital features, you won't want to be without this handheld communication solution. Send and receive text messages and photos. Transfer data 3.5 times faster with DV Fast Data Mode. Communicate with the touch of your fingertips. Perfect for small spaces, the IC7100 is the ideal D-Star option for wherever you may be. Angled control head and touchscreen for quick intuitive operation, large internal speaker for clear digital audio, and it's perfect for multi-band and all-mode communications. Get more information on all the great ICOM radios at icomamerica.com slash amateur. You can tune in and enter to win ICOM's weekly drawing for great ICOM swag like t-shirts and hats at icomamerica.com slash hamnation. Learn how you can win the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. Go to icomamerica slash hamnation for official rules and to check out all of ICOM's previous drawing winners. Uh, the August winner of the ICOM ID880H Switchable VHF UHF transceiver is Santos Whiskey 5 Sierra Juliet Romeo. And for the September grand prize, it's going to be an ICOM ID51A+. That's a dual band, dual watch VHF UHF digital transceiver with analog and D-star, near me repeater function, enhanced DPRS, fast DV data mode, and more. Sign up, good luck, and don't forget to follow ICOM America Inc. on Facebook and Twitter. And Lisa Marie Lumine, uh, we have a photo of her. She's going to be doing our amateur radio newsline up now. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report 2027, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, September 7th, 2016. As Amateur Radio Newsline went to production, more storms were bearing down on different parts of the U.S. and hams were getting prepared to assist. We have team coverage. 
The area of greatest concern right now is Tropical Storm Hermine in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's sitting like a cocked pistol aimed at Apalachicola, Tallahassee, and areas near this region of the Florida Panhandle. Late Wednesday night, the National Hurricane Center issued hurricane warnings for coastal and inland areas from just east of Panama City, east to Cross City, Florida, as well as inland areas that include nine counties due north of this coastal region up to the Florida-Georgia state line. Landfall anticipated late Thursday night as a Category 1 hurricane. The tract of Hermine takes it up the east coast, north of Washington, D.C., up to the New York State area late Sunday when it should start to make an eastward turn, according to the latest model data. If Hermine wasn't enough, hams in Hawaii are bracing for not one, but two tropical systems over the next 72 hours. Tropical Storm Madeline is tracking south the big island of Hawaii, moving west westward as of Wednesday night local Hawaii time and is predicted to lose strength. However, behind Madeline is Hurricane Lester. Lester is expected to move across the main Hawaii islands as a Category 1 hurricane between Saturday and Sunday local Hawaii time. As it tracks northwestward across the islands, it should continue to weaken, though. If it weren't enough, a new tropical wave has just formed in the far eastern Atlantic. Reporting from Jasper, Alabama, I'm Bobby Best, WX for ALA. Meanwhile, in India, monsoonal rains have led to deadly flooding, and amateurs have been activated to provide emergency communications. At least 300 have lost their lives as villages in the eastern region were evacuated and residents sought higher ground. In central India, JU, VU2, JAU reports that hams have been deployed to help prevent flood-related accidents as the water levels deepen. The Ganges River floods are reported to have broken previous records as water levels reached unprecedented levels at four locations in the north. The highest record was measured in the state of Bihar, where floodwaters reached 50.52 meters or 166 feet as of August 26th. That was Skeeter Nash, N5ASH. The United States National Parks on the Air Centennial continues through the rest of the year, and there's one more scenic wilderness to consider, thanks to a gift from a foundation created by a multimillionaire businesswoman. Just call it MN84. The nation's newest national monument within the U.S. National Park Service is much more than that, of course. It's just under 87,500 acres in northern Maine, and it will be known as the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. The land donation, valued at $100 million, was given to the federal government by Elliottsville Plantation Incorporated, a foundation created by philanthropist Roxanne Quimby, who created the property over a period of years by buying parcels up from lumber companies. It's not far from Maine's Baxter State Park and Mount Katahdin, the highest peak in Maine. National Parks on the Air participants are now able to make plans for the site, which features the east branch of the Penobscot River and a section of the Maine woods popular among cross-country skiers, snowshoers, canoers, and fishing enthusiasts. Add to that list now all of those amateur radio operators who will no doubt soon be setting their sights on MN84. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Heather Emby, KB3TZD. And finally this week, meet a guy who really puts the O in OM. There are OMs in amateur radio, and then there are really OMs. Cliff Kehart, W4KKP of White Rock, South Carolina, definitely falls into the latter category. Kehart is 104 years old and has been an active licensed ham for 79 years and counting. I recently had the privilege of speaking with Mr. Kehart, who was first licensed in 1937. I asked him how he got interested in amateur radio. Well, uh, as a kid, I think I was 10 years old, a buddy of mine came along and put earphones on my head, and I heard radio for the first time. Kehart is still quite active on the air. Even moving into a retirement home couldn't stop him. I, I'm living in, a, in sort of a retirement place here. I, I sort of miss my radio, ham radio, right away, so... I uh, talked around a little bit and I got permission to install my radio equipment here. Right now I'm the 40 meter band, but I work all bands from here. So I'm enjoying radio. So listen for W4KKP on the air and try to work the man who may possibly be the oldest active ham in the world. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Paul Brown, WD9GCO. 
Be sure to check out Paul's full interview on this week's Newsline, an extended version on our extra page. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio. News for four decades and counting at www.arnewsline.org. With Bobby Bess, WX4ALA, Skeeter Nash, and 5 ash Heather MB, KB3TZD, Paul Brown, WD9GCO, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT, at the news desk in New York and our news team across the globe. I'm Lisa Marie Lumine. Don will be back next week, 73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. That's pretty amazing. I can't imagine having your ticket that long. I'm coming up on my 10th year of having my ticket in November. I have to renew my license. That's pretty amazing with that gentleman. Well, we have a very special treat tonight. Dr. Tamitha Scove, she's live with us and she's going to do a big segment for us tonight. Uh, are you ready to go there, Tamitha? I sure hope so. Hopefully I don't lose you guys. I'm going to try to keep the science jargon down to a minimum. So are we ready to go? If you guys uh, have been on the bands recently, especially this past week, you know that the bands have been terrible. There's got to be some space weather reason and sure enough, I've got it for you. We have this absolutely massive a coronal hole that's been just terrorizing Earth. And the reason for that is because it's just, just grazing the Earth strike zone. It's just kind of just above the Earth, but it's been taking about five days or so to finally pass through the Earth strike zone. And it's been bringing with it some amazingly fast wind and some issues. We also have this hole down here that's been doing the same thing. And together they've just brought just wave after wave after wave of this fast wind that just slams the earth one wave after another and continues the storming over and over and over again. And believe it or not, no flare in sight. This has all been due to these coronal holes and the fast wind that comes from them. So it, this is going to continue pro over the next couple days as things are finally beginning to settle down. And outside of this one big filament that we've got right here, and we've got another one that you can't really see right there. We've been watching this, very nervous that this thing was going to let loose. It has not. It is now moving out of the Earth strike zone, so it looks like we're going to be in the clear. So thank goodness, because you ham radio operators really need a break from all of this fast wind and storming. Let me go ahead and switch to the uh, x-ray uh, flux levels. So as you can see right here, there, here's some x-ray flux levels. Our M-flare threat level is right here. We are well below that. And in fact, we're actually below what I call the seafloor. The seafloor is the sea flare level where basically anything below that, you really don't get much in terms of disruptions uh, for amateur radio. So we're very much below that. We actually are dropping even still. So pretty soon we might even get into issues where we're not having even enough solar flux to uh, cause, you know, allow decent propagation. But right now we're still hanging on. So the band should be getting better uh, just because we have the, the solar wind conditions settling down. Now, regarding, uh, if I flip to, to the planetary K index, you can see here, let me flip this up. Hopefully you can see that. Um, yeah, it looks like you can. Um, hang on, one more second here. There we go. So the planetary K index, this is basically what we call a stoplight chart. Green is good, yellow is active conditions, and then uh, red is storm levels. You can see we're actually getting back down into the green. I'll show you a, a chart later that, that actually shows the history of this and you'll see all red and yellow. But we actually are getting back down to the green, which is good news for you amateur radio operators. Things are beginning to settle down and will continue to settle down over the next couple days uh, as, as conditions continue to improve. Now let me go ahead and get my uh, five days up here for you. And for the Solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities. This also gives you a hint of whether, where, where our solar storms are continuing to, to die down. At high latitudes is about 60 degrees north. Uh, NOAA is only giving us about a 15 to 20% chance of a minor storm with a peak right around September 8th, which is uh, essentially what tomorrow or today in certain parts of the world. And then things will continue to calm down. At mid latitudes, we're expecting only unsettled conditions and even going into normal conditions. And so basically by Friday and into the weekend, things look like they're gonna get very nice uh, for amateur radio and, um, and it's just gonna continue to improve. So that's, uh, and, and if I flip now to, hold on, the next one, let me give you your flare, whoops, wrong way. Your flare conditions, I'll zoom it up real fast, hold on and make it big enough for you guys to even see it. This is September 7th through the 11th. You can see we still have about a 15% chance uh, for an M-class flare. We have region 2585, which is showing some level of, of um, 
growth and it's kind of driving us a little bit crazy right now uh, because it doesn't know whether it wants to get big or, or small, go to sleep or stay awake. So NOAA is giving us about a 15% chance of an M-class flare. Uh, that's probably going to continue for, for the next uh, few days. Uh, and then in Region 2588 might also give us something, but they, they look like they're going to be potentially calming down. Right now our flux levels are 10.7 flux is about 93. You need a minimum of about 70 to, to uh, allow for propagation. Uh, so we're still doing okay, but the ham radio fluxes, you know, the, the, the propagation will be marginal. We also don't expect any radiation storms here in the future. So uh, things are looking reasonably good. And like I said, as the solar wind continues to calm down, uh, especially through the weekend, things should start looking pretty nice for you amateur radio operators. So that's about it for the, um, for the uh, what do you call this, this um, the space weather stuff. Now let me give you a little bit of in of, of a tutorial here on ionospheric conditions. Uh, I was asked to to give a, a little bit of a tutorial and about propagation in the ionosphere. I'm trying to align the camera, so hopefully you guys. I don't know if you can read the text, but don't worry. That's that. I'll go over all that. Um, this is a, a tutorial to kind of give you a refresher on what the ionosphere is and all the different layers of propagation that you can see, and uh, basically how space weather affects it. Hopefully this will kind of give you guys a little bit better feel for uh, some of the things that I'm, that I'm talking about and the types of, of space weather events that, that, uh, that will affect you and how they affect the, uh, the propagation. So to, to just start off, to remind you that the ionosphere is basically a charged region uh, that's basically the upper atmosphere. It would be neutral except for the fact that the sun's ultraviolet light charges it. And that is very nice because it now gives you like this sea of electrons that then can uh, carry currents and carry charge any, anywhere it pretty much wants to. And that facilitates radio propagation. Without it, we really wouldn't be able to do uh, any DX or anything like that. So, um, so that's really the basics idea of the, of the ionosphere. But I'm sure all of you know that there are more than just one layer of ionosphere. There's actually multiple layers. And people ask me all the time, well, why? What, what, is the, what do these layers mean? And let me try to um, see if I can close this so that you don't get distracted here. Maybe that's even more distracting, I don't know. Um, so what I've got here is a picture of the ionosphere during the daytime and during the nighttime. And what I was talking about is electron density. So you know, basically what, what causes the ionosphere to, um, what causes the ionosphere to actually be, 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 um, uh, be allow propagation is that you actually are ionizing, you're actually ripping the electrons right off of these neutral atoms. So the sun is doing this called some, through something called photoionization. So it's literally tearing off these electrons right off the atoms. And the atoms, of course, at the same time are trying to get them back. So it's kind of, uh, if you think about it in terms of like, like uh, boys and girls, you've got, you know, since this is a YL thing, I can do this. Um, you've got, you know, got guys that are like trying to pull the, girl, the girl's clothes off right in the bedroom. And the girls are like, no, 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 I'm keeping them on. And the guy's like, no, 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 you're not. And the girl's like, yeah, okay. So there's this kind of fight going on in the bedroom, really in our upper atmosphere. And basically whoever is winning that fight at one particular time depends upon the layer or the, uh, that you're in, the altitude that you're at. And what you're looking at here is, it, let's take just the day side, for instance, you're looking at electron density and it goes up as you move to the right. And, and it goes up in altitude as we go up the, the screen here. So when you look at the D region, you really don't have a lot of electron density. I'm looking at this black line that goes up. But as you continue to go up in altitude, the sun begins to really strip off these electrons. And, and the, uh, the neutral atoms are trying to fight to get it back. But at some point, uh, depending upon the atmospheric chemistry and what species of, of atoms are in at that particular altitude, there's a balance, there's, there's, a, there's a peak. There's a peak at which the, the sun is doing the best job. It's winning the fight. The girls are, aren't able to keep their clothes on. Let me, let me put it that way. And then as you continue to go up in altitude, the girls begin to win the fight uh, because of just a particular kind of atmospheric chemistry. Certain species are more prevalent than others. And, and, uh, and so the girls are able to keep their clothes on, but then they'll, they'll, they'll start losing the battle again as, 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 again, situations change as you go up in altitude. Um, so as, as you see these peaks, these little humps, they are actually the layers of the atmosphere, of, of, of the ionosphere. So you've got the sporadic E and the E layer that's about 100 uh, kilometers. You've got an F1 layer that's sitting about 200 kilometers and an F2 layer that's sitting at about 300 kilometers during the day. Now at nighttime, things simplify quite a bit because now you no longer have the sun trying to tear the girls' clothes off. It's a little bit easier for the girls to keep their clothes on at night, which seems kind of counterintuitive when you think about it. But 
nonetheless. Um, so what happens is that you've got an F1 layer and the F2 layer, they actually com collapse into a single F layer. Again, the atmospheric chemistry that's going on, this little tug of war uh, of electrons is, is changing. So you only have one peak here. And then down in here, the D layer disappears and uh, the E layer is not quite as strong. It's kind of sporadic, meaning you get peaks and valleys a little bit here and there, but it's not really a consistent layer all the way across. So you do have to totally different conditions here and from the daytime to the nighttime. And when you try to think about, okay, how does that work globally? Uh, what does that mean? If I were to try to picture it around the globe, if I can get my mouse, um, what are we actually really dealing with? So like you, if you take those layers and you wrap them around the globe, you kind of begin to get a visual picture of how this is what, how this is being affected and what's really happening. So you've got the day side of the Earth, and you've got your four layers, your F1 or F2, F1, E, and D layers sitting here. But then at nighttime, things get this, the picture gets up very very simplified. The F layers collapse into a single F layer, and both the E and D regions pretty much disappear. But what's interesting is this region right in here. This is just right after the Terminator. And it's really a whole region that's just entering Earth, basically Earth's shadow, where the sun, you know, the Earth is actually shadowing out the, the sunlight uh, from these, the upper part of this atmosphere. And you notice as the layers fade out here, it's not happening all at once. It's not just at the Terminator. It's actually a, a broad region in which this happens. And there's an amazing amount of change that's going on all at once. You get conductivity changing, you get layers coming in and out, and they're all kind of collapsing all at once. But it's not just a light switch. It's kind of a fade. So this region is actually a third kind of region for, uh, for, for considering what type of, of space weather effects and what type of ionospheric propagation you're going to get. So you not just have day. You don't just have night. You have day, night, and what we call the gray line or the gray region. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. So when you think about it from a global perspective, when you're doing DX and you're doing, and I don't see this, um, I don't see this highlighted enough when I look at some of these texts uh, of talking about radio propagation in the ionosphere. What they don't talk about so much is that it's so important to know when you are, not just where you are in the globe, but when you are. And that is also really critical when it comes to space weather as well, because things are ordered by a local time. You know, and, and in space weather, they're actually ordered by something what we call magnetic local time, which adds the, mag the effect of the magnetic field into all of this, um, all of this change. So let me, let me now kind of talk about the, the layers and really what, prop what type of propagation do you expect to get? Now, what I've done is I've, we've got the, the, the sunlit layer here, we've got the nighttime here, and I've also, we've also got this area here that's kind of showing the gray region. So these are the three regions that we need to talk about. Now you can see with the D layer, we kind of simplified it. We've only got one of the F layers here. Uh, here's the E layer and then the D layer down here. Now during the daytime, your 60, 80, and 160 meter bands, forget it. The D layer pretty much absorbs them all. So you're going to have a hard time ever trying to use them during the daytime. Your 30 and 40 meter however, bands, however, will, uh, will uh, refract off the E layer and or reflect off the E layer and you can get some some good propagation there. Uh, also, the 10 to the 20 meter band that will that will uh, reflect off of the F layer. Now, when you get to this gray line, things begin to change. Suddenly, that 60, 80, and, and 160 meter bands, those things actually will begin to propagate off the F layer, which is wonderful because during the day they weren't really working. But that gives you an idea that in the gray line, you start getting these interesting propagation effects. Now, granted, the F layer as well as the E layer, they're not gone. I mean, the E layer hasn't totally disappeared yet. And even some of the D layer hasn't disappeared yet, but you'll get holes and you'll get the E layer changing as well as the F layer changing, they're collapsing. So this is where you get some magic, where some, you get some really interesting and very difficult to predict uh, effects when it comes to propagation. Now at night, you can get your, you have the, the F layer is a lot lower, so you can get some decent propagation on, let's say, 60 and 80 meters, uh, hitting the F layer as well as your 30 and 40 meter band. And then, of course, your, your 10 to 20 meter band uh, goes right through the F layer. So hopefully that gives you an idea. But there, you, the, the, what the, the take home here is that really to know if you're going to be talking about your skip, um, you know, your skip up uh, and, and your and MUF and all of that kind of stuff, 
realize that it's not just, of course, one area. It's not just day. It's not just night. It's three separate areas. All of this is going to change. Even if your MUF is the same, you're still going to have different skip distances and, and other things like that. So it really matters where you are. And again, this is really imperative when it comes to space weather as well. Now, I'm going to complicate this picture more by not just saying that these layers are, are just nice straight curves. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what happens when you add space weather into the mix. So let's talk about the D region, E region, and F region again. This is kind of just a cartoon, but it gives you an idea of what space weather really does to you. What happens now is that when you have, a, when you put this into reality, you take it away from the models and you do it for real. Now what happens is that these beautiful flat surfaces, these flat layers suddenly become warped. You have things like atmosphere, atmospheric heating instabilities that come up from below and push parts of the ionosphere up so it bends the layers. You get waves in neutral and charged regions that then can cause conductivity changes and all this kind of stuff. So now your signal is no longer looking at a plain mirror. It's now looking at something that's rippled, like, uh, like dropping a stone into a pond of water and watching the ripples. Imagine that being your F layer now. And now you've got to bounce a signal off that. And where does it go? I mean, when you think about it, it's kind of like the difference between looking at a regular mirror and looking at yourself in a funhouse mirror. You have no idea what you're going to get. And that's what space weather really can do to you. And, and on top of that, now, if it's not bad enough to have to deal with, with uh, you know, rippled uh, layers, now you also have things like signal refraction. Because what will happen is that you'll get some space weather effect that will change what we call the conductivity, basically the, the amount of electrons in part of a layer. And when that happens, suddenly you get uh, the same effect that you get when you stick a pencil in water. At the interface of the pencil in the water, it looks like the pencil is bent. Have you ever seen that? You just dip it in there and it looks like it's bending like this. Well, it's the same kind of thing. You get this refraction. So now your signal that you're transmitting is now not long, no longer going in straight lines. It's actually bending at this, this change in conductivity because it actually changes the index of refraction for that signal. So that's a space weather effect. And it ha we have this problem all the time with GPS giving the wrong answer because of these signal refractions. Now imagine currents in charged regions. This is things like aurora, or which cause things like signal scintillation. What happens there is you actually have Currents. I mean, you saw that picture of the aurora. Those are actually currents going through the ionosphere. And when you have that, now think of a whole bunch of tiny little ripples on the water. And your signal, instead of just, just bending and refracting, now it scatters on all sorts of different directions. And that scattering can change. So you're looking at some a signal that's doing this. And some of these signals can get out of phase and then destructively interfere. And that's when you get on the bands and you hear this weird modulation and you hear the signal fades and comb filtering. If you're an audio engineer, you know what that means. Uh, you hear all these weird types of EQ, like somebody's playing with the EQ uh, on your on your, your audio um, rig. And, and so you can get these types of problems. And we call that scintillation. And if you want a visual uh, metaphor for this, just look up at the night sky a clear, on a clear night and take a look at the stars. You ever see them twinkle? When they twinkle, did you know? That is visual scintillation. Those are light waves that are scintillating. So basically in ham radio, you hear the twinkle, twinkle little star. So I'll bet you never sing the song the same way again. That's what I've mentioned to people before. Uh, so that, that signal scintillation can give you things like signal fade and the phase modulations I'm talking about. Now, all of this is going on all at the same time that you're dealing with, uh, with just the problems and the complexities of all these different layers. So you can imagine, when people say that, why isn't my model working? Or why, why is DX so hard and so unpredictable? Well, it's because there's so many different facets to it that are really hard to control and really hard to understand at any one time. And here's an example. I'll just show this very quickly. I know I'm probably running out of time. Um, but we, here's, here's a model of the world you can see right here. And this is just for the D layer. And what we've got going on, we've got, this is the daytime, uh, uh, this is where local noon is right here, but we had a solar flare and it really lights up the whole atmosphere, uh, causes major radio noise, as you all know. This is a, um, a particle radiation storm that lit up the whole northern and southern pole. And then here is the gray line. As you can see, there's a lot of color changes and it's not just one line, it's a very broad band. And so when you look at maps like this, like the D map here, that or D wrap map, that kind of gives you an idea of what the, what you know, what's happening in terms of absorption of your HF frequencies. Um, you don't just look at where, the, where it's all red. I mean, red is bad, granted. But if you really want to know what's interesting, 
look at how where the color changes rapidly. So right across here from purple to red, that's a big change across there. That means a ton of conductivity is changing. And that's where the magic happens. And it would happen here and it would happen here. Anywhere you see these colors changing very rapidly. So that's why uh, with these types of conductivity changes, that's why uh, it can be a very, very complicated thing, but it also can be very magical. And I think, do I have any time left? Because if I do, I'll talk about this. But if not, I can save this particular thing for later. It's talking about KP, AP, and X-ray flux and how you can use those to help you understand what the space weather is doing. And I don't know. Do, I, do we need to throw everything back? Um, I'm not sure where we are in time because we kind of got started out of sequence. Victor probably has more of a handle on time, but I think people are finding this so fascinating. I would say continue. I mean, this is okay. great. Oh, good. Okay. So, uh, so yeah. Okay. So to, to talk about this last little bit, I know I threw a lot of stuff at you uh, all at once. It's kind of like drinking from a fire hose, but uh, I'll give you a last little bit here that can, might be able to give you some help. When you look at some of these solar indices and these space weather indices and you think, God, aren't they all just, don't they have just one index that I can look at that tells me everything? I hate to tell you this, the answer is no. But if you, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the most popular indices uh, and really what they mean and what they don't mean. Uh, the biggest thing we, we see are KP, AP, or K and A, and then uh, people look at either the X-ray flux or they look at the F10.7 flux to try to understand what space weather is doing and how it's going to affect radio propagation. And all I can say is that KP and AP do totally different things compared to the X-ray flux and F10.7, and I'll go into that now. Um, KP is pretty much my go-to index for, um, or what I would say is a, a simple, a simple go-to index for things like solar storms. This is particle, um, th these are things that cause aurora. These are the big geomagnetic storms. And this is actually the KP index over the last week from basically September 1st all the way through uh, today. And you can see, this is what I was talking about earlier with the, with the space weather. We had an absolutely monstrous set of solar storming uh, that just was almost nonstop simply because uh, of that big coronal hole gave us so much fast wind. We had tons of active conditions being yellow, storm conditions is anything that's red. Uh, we had uh, what we call a KP of six, which was really bad storm conditions. But then we had little pockets of green. See that each one of these bars is about three hours, or is three hours, it's a three hour average. So we'd have three hours here, six hours here, that kind of thing, and then we'd storm for a long time. And then things are now beginning to finally settle down. Now what's useful about the KP index is that even though it's a little bit behind because they have to wait for three hours before they average it all together and then put out a number. So it does lag real time just a little bit. So it's not good for things like Aurora, but it's okay for, for radio um, because the ionosphere takes a little while to, to respond as well. But what's good about KP is that if you wanna get on the bands for six hours, let's say, you actually might be very interested in this, in this period here. So the KP index will tell you, hey, you might actually get some marginal radio propagation during this small window, okay? And then, you know, you might get another window here that's a little bit longer. Here's about 12 hours, right? So, you know, you can actually use KP to kind of help you along if you, as long as you just take pay attention to the green and leave away the, the yellow and the red. But if you use the AP index, the AP index, it's simply a kind of a summation of what's going on with KP. The AP index has one bar for each day. Now it's a slightly different scale. This is these scales go from basically zero to nine and the AP index goes from zero to a hundred essentially. But nonetheless, it's still color coded if you go to, to NOAA, to the SWPC website and you still get a decent idea uh, of what the codes are and what, what, is, what is active um, conditions and storming conditions compared to good conditions. But the problem is, is if I just use the AP index, which gives you one basically value per day then I would say basically September 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th, I wouldn't have been able to get on the bands at all. Forget it, just hang it up, it's, it's over. But actually, if you go back to KP, no, that's not true. You had a three hour band here, you had six hours here, another three hours, and you actually had some time a little bit in here. So you actually don't get as much information from AP. And I personally, I don't use it. It's, it's good for, for scientists who are looking for long-term trends or for climatology. But for weather, it just doesn't give you enough information. So um, if you had a choice, try KP, okay? Now, looking at X-ray flux and F10.7, this is a totally different ballpark. And this is the thing that, that uh, I know always confuses people. 
is because I see it over and over and over again. People say, well, as soon as there's an X-ray, a flare in the X-ray flux, KP will immediately jump high. And it's like, no, that doesn't happen. Sometimes it doesn't happen at all. And sometimes KP will jump when there's not been an X-ray flare at all, as you can see in this case. This is the same period, September 1st all the way to September 8th. Same period as here. This is the M-flare threat meter, this, this liar, M-flare threat level, this line right here. And as you can see, we are well below that. We haven't even popped any C-class flares. So this is radio quiet. And, and yet, KP is all over the place. So what we're talking about here are two totally different phenomena. And that's why it's so important that you have to look at both. X-ray flux and F10.7 tells you about radio propagation in terms of uh, ultraviolet light hitting the ionosphere and lighting up the, the ionosphere either enough for radio propagation or giving you so much with an, X, with an X-ray flare that you end up drowning out any radio propagation because the sun is making all the radio noise. So that's what this tells you. This is all about light. These, KP index is all about geomagnetic storms, big massive burps from and belches from the sun that carry particles and magnetic field to the earth that are slow and slam into the earth and cause aurora. Two totally different things. So really when it comes right down to it, if you want to look at, if you want to look at indices, KP is a great one. And even just looking at the GOES X-ray flux, that's a great one too, because you can see where the flares are and you can kind of see where our solar flux levels are. And if they get to about the B level uh, down here, you're going to start kind of worrying about radio propagation. As long as they're in between B and C, radio propagation should be pretty marginal, if, if, if not okay. So hopefully that helps kind of give you guys a little bit more feel for what indices to use when you look at NOAA and what they're for and why you have to look at all of them. Back to you, Val. Oh, that was wonderful. And, and it was really nice putting a good visual on something that we probably had to memorize to get our ticket. Um, so it really made it easy. And uh, I think you put a whole new meaning on F layer. <laughs> um, what's the website you go to for, the, for a lot of that? What website do you use? The, the, the official website is, is the NOAA SWPSI website. I think it's, uh, it's w, I, I may get this wrong, but it's www. As a matter of fact, I can, I can look it up. Hold on one second. Let me pull up my, I don't want to give you the wrong one. Um, so it's www.swipsy, which is swpc.noaa.gov. I don't know if you can see that. Probably not. Okay. It's swpc.noaa.gov. And that gives Perfect. you basically all of the space weather information uh, and all these indices. Uh, it's a little bit thick to get through, but um, you can hunt for them and you can find them. And uh, especially for radio propagation, they actually have a dashboard, what they call a dashboard for radio propagation. And that will get you started. Did any of you guys have one, something you wanted to ask or add to this? Um, well, uh, uh, you guys out there, if you have any questions, Dr. T is going to be around to the end. So make sure you let Kendra and Abby know in the chat room that you have some questions for Dr. T. Really appreciate you giving us that tutorial. That was brilliant. Thank and you. Now, yeah. And uh, well, now let's hear a word from DX Engineering. Hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, fires, just some of the natural disasters we've been talking about across the United States just this summer. And we're not even into winter yet. Oh, my Lord, the snow up in the north. This should serve as a reminder to keep your MCOM station ready. And DX Engineering can ensure that you are prepared. Not if, but when disaster strikes your community. DX Engineering has paired select Comet and Rig Expert antenna analyzers with perfectly sized equipment cases from Nanook to ensure that your precision analyzer stays protected during a crisis. Each case is filled with cubed, sectioned foam. That means you can remove the exact amount you need. You can also remove additional foam if you'd like to fit in any extra connectors or accessories that you might think uh, you're going to need in there. They fit just fine. The combos are available with virtually any color Nanook case. You can see all the case and analyzer combos at DXEngineering.com. Of course, you got to run that stuff, and DX Engineering has your power demands covered when the grid goes down. Not if, when. You'll find batteries, battery boxes, battery backups, all the DC power cables you're going to need to build a comprehensive power system for your MCOM station. They also have rock-solid power supplies from Samlex and Astron to feed your sensitive radio gear. And if you want to run solar, 
DX Engineering carries Aspect Solar products, including the Energy Bar Portable Power Packs. These lightweight Energy Bar units feature multiple USB ports and traditional cigarette lighter outputs, and certain models even have a built-in inverter and an outlet to power your AC devices. You got to have an antenna, and Bushcom antennas have been thoroughly vetted out in the Australian Outback. They are ideal for an MCOM station set up in ugly weather. Bushcom's SWE series broadband and fed antennas are the perfect choice for MCOM. They cover 80 through 10, can be purchased with an optional quick deployment kit. And of course, a good antenna needs the best coax available, and that's DX Engineering's coax. The custom cable assemblies are built using precision machines to your exact specifications. You'll find a huge assortment of cable and connector options for virtually any application. And the free custom cable builder tool at DXEngineering.com will help you get started. The custom cable builder can also be used to create custom ground braid assemblies. And, of course, DX Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the industry. Get your order in by 10 p.m. Eastern, and if it's in stock, it'll be on a track headed your way tonight proven products expert advice dx engineering helps you shrink the globe request your catalog or shop online 24 7 365 at dxengineering.com slash ham nation dxengineering.com slash ham nation dx engineering thank you so much for your support of ham nation and now it's time for smoke and solder and that's going to be brought to us this week by audrey km4 bravo uniform november hi it's audrey and today we decided to make a silicon transistor inverter. This came about around 1964. So, one of the lead roles in, in our schematic is the NPN, not pointing in, transistor. So, we have our emitter, our collector, and our base, which is kind of different. Base was made by doping in the middle. That's a little red line right there. The base. Um, it is a 2N3053 Motorola transistor. It is vintage from 1968. Another way to describe it is it is a BJT, a bipolar tra bipolar junction transistor. We have two resistors actually, R1 and R2. R1 is conveniently located right there. It is a 1K, 1,000 ohm resistor. And the way you can tell what the value of resistor is, is around the resistor, there are little color bands, and they each have value. And so for this specific one, it is, the, the values are uh, 10 times 10 to the second, which is basically 10 to the third, so 1,000. And then we have another one, R2, which is located right here off the base. And that is uh, brown, black, and orange. And it is 10 to 10 multiplied 10 to the third. So it's 10 to the fourth. Okay, so now to get to explain to this, explain the circuit. So let's start a ground. So we go up. Here is our power supply, a nine volt battery go up. We have a switch here. This is our switch for power. Pretty normal. Keep going. We have our second resistor, which is 10,000 ohms. And a little disclaimer is that resistors limit current, not voltage. They limit current. Yeah. Then we have our voltage amp, which is reference. Okay, now if you move on to emitter, it doesn't look that exciting. I'll admit it. But it plays a very important role. This is the ground. This is how the transistor is linked to ground. It is essential. You need ground. Uh. So that's the emitter's job. Okay, then we have the collector. So you go off the collector and it's it's voltage out. It's the first thing you see. Keep going. R1, that's our 1K resistor. And then we have our 9 volt right there. Okay, so then we have our tooth table. So if you're gonna put a low voltage in, you get a high voltage out. If you put a high voltage in, you get a low voltage out. This connects to binary because you put a low in, you get a one. You put a high in, you get a zero. So you can express binary this way. Um, so low 
high, high to low. High is 1, low is 0. And then a little fact is that your phone and computer have not one, not two, but a few billion circuits, just like this, a few billion, just think, a few billion. This is a transistor. It is a Motorola transistor. That's what we did. Bye. So I hope you remembered everything I told you. So let's move on to the real actual circuit we built with this is our real life circuit. I know there's a lot of wires. That looks complicated as all get out. Well, it's not that complicated. Yeah. So this is our little lead roll I talked about earlier. That's our transistor right there. Okay. Then we have our resistors, which I talked about. One's right there. That is our 1K, located right there. And our 10K, that's our 1K. Here's our 10K, right? They're so small, there. I could barely see them. Oh, well, they were much bigger at one time. Yeah. Okay, you want to power up our circuit? Let's do that. So, where's that 9 volt battery in the switch? It is right there. Oh, and that's right. our switch, and we have our two meters. Okay. He is a little, he is under, just under 9, nine volts. Pretty close to that 9 volts, huh? So, and that's a 9 volt battery. All right. Now, let's see the magic happen. Oh, so you move the meters a little closer now? Yeah, so you, you can kind of see the comparison better. We did our best. So, okay, so right now I had this, I have this in the positive, and that is high and that is low. So now, watch the magic. Ooh, the output went high. Now. Oh, they're moving in the opposite direction, so it truly is an inverter. It is an inverter. When one is high, one is low. Say, so what's that blue sign there mean? That is my amateur radio call sign. Kilo Mike 4, Bravo Uniform November. KM4, BUM. KM4, BUN. I love my call sign. Bye. She's just adorable. And no, for those of you asking in the chat room, that's not George's daughter. Uh, <laughs> definitely an engineer in the making. And uh, oh, she was just wonderful. What'd you think, Amanda? I absolutely love Audrey. And um, I can't wait to meet. She's coming to Colorado with her dad and her brother. And I can't wait to meet them. And uh, Jack, little Jack, he's about to get licensed as well. And Tom and Jan are her parents. And they're so proud of her. And I Skyped with them for a little bit. One quick thing. This is so cute. I asked Tom, I said, why, why did you get Audrey into ham radio? He said, to keep the boys away from her. She's going to be an engineer and she won't need them anymore. So <laughs> I love that. Um, thank you, Audrey, for submitting that video. And we can't, have, we can't wait to have you on live sometime soon. So, all right, you guys, let's get started here. Victor's got some slides here that he's going to show for you. And we're going to go over some Aries ICS forms. I know this is almost as boring as a Smith chart, but not quite. I promise you. If you want to impress uh, your served agencies, follow these rules. Essentials to making a great IAP, your incident action plan. For any event, incident, um, you guys down there in Louisiana, Look at this stuff and make sure that you know how to fill out these forms to help make your ARIES run smoothly. So you start with a cover page, a 201, which is your map, a 202, which is description of the event, 
205, which is your radio frequencies, 205A, which is your operators and their tactical call signs. And also don't forget the 214, which is the log sheet. So let's go over a couple of those forms. We'll go over it quickly. I know we're a little bit out of time here. So don't forget your cover page. This may make it look pretty. Add a cover page. It makes everybody want to look at your incident action plan. So we'll go on from there to the 201. Well, actually, we're going to start at the 202. I apologize. So you want to make sure you keep it simple and clear and stay on point. So um, some of the things you want to do is describe what the event is and what your duties are. And again, keep it very simple and clear. So some of the things that we add on here in your general situational awareness is saying, um, it's sunny outside, bring sunscreen, bring water, bring your food, bring your snacks. So you want to learn how to fill out these forms. And um, again, I can't stress it enough. Keep it simple. Uh, let's go over to the next form here. We have the 204. Now, I don't necessarily say that this is an essential form unless let's look at the um, the the Baton Rouge flooding when they had different um, uh, Red Cross shelters. So during those Red Cross shelters, you want to make sure that you have a lead contact during everything. And I know this isn't looking very clear to me, so it might not be looking very clear to you, but I do have this form available and we can I can send it to anybody or we can put it on the wiki notes later. So you want to make sure you have your leads at every single shelter and have their tactical calls as well. So now we'll go over to the 205. Now the 205 is, is very simple. We all understand a 205 because it's our radio frequencies. This is what we're going to be using during any event. Right now, this one is for my 100 mile bicycle ride that I'm getting ready to do in, uh, in a couple of weeks from now, actually. And it goes over all the different um, repeaters in the area that we will be using. And then there's backup repeaters as well. Not only that, then we also use a DMR repeaters. And that's kind of our backup channel, our frequencies that you can use. A lot of times you, want, you might want to have some back chatter. And it's very important to have those um, secondary channels as well. Not only that, but we always add simplex frequencies just in case. What if there's a power outage while you're trying to run your 100-mile bicycle ride? Well, the bike ride is going to go on. So make sure you have those simplex frequencies in there as well. Let's go over to our 205A. And the block out there is our phone number. So I don't want you all calling all of my um, helpers here during our events. So basically, this is going to have your tactical call signs first in the first column. And then the second is going to have your name and your call sign. And remember, everybody, when you're doing events, you always use your tactical call signs in and your call sign out. So when you're calling net control, you're going to say net control, this is aid station one. And then net control is going to say aid station one, go ahead. Aid station one is going to say, hey, uh, we're running low on oranges, bread, and we need some more water. And net control is going to say aid station one, I copy all of the information. Thank you very much. And then you'll clear with your call sign. It's as simple as that. Now, the phone numbers are important to keep in your 205A because always things can go wrong or you might want to talk about things that you might not want to talk about on air. So always include the, your cell phone numbers in your information. Let's move on. Now it's always important and this is typically your 201. Um, you always add a map. That's always important. During the Hayden Pass fire, you even had a map coverage of where the fire was and its predicted area to move to just lets everybody know what's going on. And it's always a reference point. Always have those references. They're very important. Now, the next thing, um, uh, Victor, if you could go, uh, there we go. We have the 214. Now, this is your logging um, form. Now, you can do it by hand. And when you're out in the field and in Colorado, and a lot of events, we're in places where we don't have any internet or cell phone coverage. So, Hand logging is very, very important. But when you're doing um, things, when you do have the internet, make sure you try to put in a Google Docs 
and you can uh, digitally log all of this and then you can live log, which is very awesome. Um, we've been working with that for quite some time now. And then you can um, log from different places at the same time simultaneously. And then you'll see everything in order and um, it all kind of makes sense to you. So you can find out what station was just asking for your cups, your refills, things like that. So, um, and I know I'm, I'm moving really quickly here because we're kind of a little bit behind time here. So uh, I won't keep anybody any longer, but I have um, two more slides here. And yes, uh, the number one thing to be successful in Aries, be active, you guys. Do your events. And if you're active in your events, then you'll actually be called to help during a situation. I have that problem so many times here that we, we become active in a fire situation or flooding or mudslides, things like that. And these hands come out from 10 years ago where they used to help in Aries and they said, oh, I'm here to help. Well, no, actually you're not because you haven't worked with us in 10 years. So stay active, you guys. Help your events out. Do the bike rides. Do the parades. It's all very, very important. So last thing I have on my he list here is not Aries related. We lost two hams here in Colorado in the last week, both females. And I just like to say goodbye to them, our silent keys. Um, the first one is Eileen and um, WD0DGL. She's been so helpful on the Colorado Ham Con Committee for so long and just passed away this last week. And then we have Ellie. Ellie is so precious. Uh, She's helped with about 60 young hams get licensed here at least out of Boulder, Colorado. And um, there's so many people who are so sad to see her go. So thank you, Ellie and Eileen. You've been great here in Colorado. Other than that, you guys, that's all I have for tonight. So we're going to go over to the chat room and see how Abby and Kendra are doing. Hi. Hi, guys. We have a couple of questions here that were asked in our chat box over the course of the evening. Um, the first one that we have is from KB3ZZ, and uh, this one's for Dr. T, and uh, wants to know, have you, Dr. T, been studying for your ham license yet? <laughs> oh, I'm never going to live this down. No, I haven't had a chance. Although uh, I tell you, by, by having you guys ask a lot of questions about radio propagation in the ionosphere, I sure have dusted up on a lot of skills because, uh, you know, I'm basically a, a what we call a space physicist that looks at everything between the sun and the earth and, and the sun and other planets in our solar system. And so my, you know, my expertise actually lies way beyond the ionosphere. So you guys have actually gotten me to, uh, to go in and, and learn some stuff that I hadn't anticipated in learning. And it's very, uh, very interesting, and I know it's going to uh, really come in handy when I take the, the exam. I've already taken a couple practice exams. I just haven't done the real thing, and I've done quite well, except for just a few you know, acronyms here and there. I'm, I'm terrible at memorizing, so I have to just kind of sit there and go, okay, one of these days I'm going to do this. And, uh, and yeah, so just keep pushing me, and I'll, and I'll get there. <laughs> That's great. Well, good luck. We should to have uh, Gordon West send you one of his uh, books so you can get the book and take yes. it. He, he already, he test. already has. Oh, he has. <laughs> <laughs> no <know>. excuses. <laughs> no excuses now. <laughs> well, if the space weather would just calm down a little bit, then you know, instead of doing these all these reports for you guys, maybe I could actually study. Uh -huh. But you know, you gotta well, talk so, to the sun. I mean, he's just keeping solar me busy minimums all the time. around the corner, so uh <laughs> right. So that that'll be when I do it. Well, you know, if anybody uh if anyone could do it, you could do it, definitely. There you go. No problem. Good. Um our next K O J and it's for Katie, Val, and Amanda. What's your most memorable contact on the air? Oh, you go well, first, I know Val. Mine. mine was when I stumbled on to uh, WB9Z's frequency. So oh. we started flirting and then dating, and now we're engaged. And so that's my most memorable contact in, in CQ Worldwide Sideband 2011. 
that's Val. That is, I still love that story to this day and love you, Jerry for, wow. You got, you two are great. I'll tell you guys about my favorite contact. And it was my first one on HF and Jeff is like, this is my fault. Yes, it is his fault. So we got, we get on a 40 meter net. I just got my AG general and, or whatever it was. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm a general. I can work 40 meters. Yay. And first Jeff goes, cause I'm a little bit nervous. And he, he makes a contact with a guy in Missouri and the guy gives him a five and seven signal report. And I'm like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And I, I talk and I'm like, yeah, you're about a five and nine here into Colorado. And he gives me a five and nine back. So I got a five and nine. Jeff got a five and seven from the same guy. Most memorable thing ever, because who wouldn't want the best signal report? Jeff is giving me the signal that Amanda is number one. If you know what I'm talking about, you guys. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> uh, um, uh, any other questions there, Abby and Kendra? Oh, we sure do. Um, okay. So our next question was from KB7NG. And um, you want to read this for us? Sure. Um, it's actually for Dr. D. They asked, what range of index numbers represent good HF propagation? Well, it depends upon what index you're talking about. As, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we we're talking about the KP index. We're talking about the F10.7 uh, solar flux. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it really depends upon which index you're talking about. Now, if we talk about KP, anything, uh, and that's a, that's a range from basically zero to nine, uh, anything I would say under four, will probably be pretty good. Um, uh, you can get to a point where you're getting lumbers that are like one and zero, and that may actually signal a bad radio propagation. But for the planetary K index, which is called KP, uh, I would say a range from zero to three is pretty good, and four would be marginal, maybe maybe getting pretty bad. Now for F10.7 flux, essentially anything F4. above about uh, 80, 85 to 90, um, you're, you're going to have marginal uh, propagation up to about 105 or so. Uh, and then you're going to, then things should be in the green and uh, you should, uh, you should be, be doing pretty well on the bands. Of course, once you get to higher uh, F10.7 flux numbers, that oftentimes is signaling that you're um, getting closer to solar maximum and there's a lot of active regions. So you do have a risk of a lot of solar flares as well. So that could be a problem for you. Um, but yeah, I'd say for solar flux numbers, you would want to be anywhere in the range of about 80 it's for marginal stuff up to about, you know, any, anything above 105 would be, good, would be really, really solid numbers. That is an awesome explanation. And thank you for, um, for sharing that with us. And the last comment that we have uh, from the chat room was from AP uh, Marty, who says, thank you, Dr. T, for both him and his wife, KE0EWK, really enjoyed your tutorials. Oh, thank you very much. I'm so glad you guys find them helpful. And, you know, just let me know if I use too much science jargon, because I'm always trying to make it uh, that much more understandable for everybody. But I have a tendency to slip back sometimes, especially in areas I don't, um, you know, I, I haven't really talked about all that much. So, so just slap my hand if I happen to use an acronym or something that, that uh, you don't, you don't quite get and I'll, I'll figure out how to say it in a better language. Dr. T, you've done great so far tonight. So we thank you so much. Ab Abby and Kendra also, thank you so much. You guys have been awesome. I'm going to make a couple announcements here. I have one ham fest announcement. I'm going to make real quick. We have um, Santa Cruz starting on, um, can you imagine that I don't have a date on this? I do believe it's this coming weekend and it's $5. So check it out. Look for the Santa Cruz ham fest. Uh, apologize, Gordo. Boy, I'm terrible tonight. <laughs> um, one more thing, a couple more things. I'm going to make some net announcements. The 40 meter net is running and they say it's doing pretty good here on 7180 tonight and no 20 meter net. Yeah, probably pop is no good. Uh, Dr. T already explained it to us. So we don't have to ask again why. And, um, uh, 
14 Charlie for the D star net and echo link. We're on do drop in. So one question for the girls, uh, Abby and uh, Kendra, do you guys still do the youth net there on echo link? Uh, yeah, we uh, still do our Thursday night youth net week <laughs> without fail trying to anyway. <laughs> and um, we still have a great crowd and we still love doing it. And it That's happens uh, every yeah, it's every Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, and it's on Echo Link 759-629. I think I know Great. that by heart. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for telling us that. One more thing. Uh, Kendra, I heard you at, that you're studying for ACT, so um, good luck there. Thank you. All right. We'll send it back to Val. Take it away, Val. Yeah, I have one more housekeeping thing to talk about, too. Uh, those of you ordering those, um, the ZZRX uh, 40 uh, little kits uh, that Randy uh, offered up, when you do place the order through PayPal, make sure you're putting your shipping address in there. A lot of people send in some orders. They've sold like 50 or so so far, and many are forgetting to put the shipping address in there. And for those of you who missed it, um, if you just go to um, orders at email uh go to orders at 4sqp.com um and or go into your paypal account and that's the uh account you want to paypal 47 dollars 50 to which is orders at 4sqp.com uh to order that kit and uh again make sure you put in your shipping orders and uh that's all we've got for tonight everybody thank you so much for joining us and uh i appreciate all you yls getting on here and uh what a wonderful show it was great thank you so much val did such a hard job organizing all this and she really did just the most awesome job so thank you val all right good night everybody thank you. good night, good night.